Hello, everyone. I'm Garrett Womble, and thank you for joining. Today's presentation and discussion by Praxis 3 Principal Brian Tanner and Georgia Tech's Amit Doshi will address the ways the library has employed contemporary retail practices to reframe how librarians interact with library patrons and is the second of our six-part webinar series on the future of research libraries. Amit Doshi is Director of Service Experience and Program Design at Georgia Tech, as well as the subject librarian for the School of Public Policy and Law at Georgia Tech. His research interests include bibliometrics, assessing the user experience, sustainability in library design, and designing library and learning spaces. He's presented at the ALA, ACRL, and the ARL Assessment National Conferences and serves as a reviewer for the Journal of Learning Spaces. In addition, importantly, <laughs> Amit is co-host of a fantastic weekly podcast about libraries called Lost in the Stacks on WREK here in Atlanta, where he and his co-host free associate an hour of music and library talk. And with those introductions, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Tanner to get us started. Great. Good morning, everybody. So we're we're telling the story of how the Georgia Tech Library in the process of reinventing itself as a research library for the 21st century developed a completely new approach to library services. Um, we're going to talk about ways that they've kind of reframed the way librarians interact with patron, patrons. So let's get started. We're going to talk about the circulation desk uh, throughout history, uh, the history of the library and, and uh, circulation desk. We're going to talk about service precedents. Uh, we're going to uh, look at models outside of traditional library models to talk about library services, which is what the, the library very much did uh, uh, during, the, during the process of designing the new Georgia Tech Library. And we're going to talk about InfoDesk, which is the service model that the library developed uh, to deliver its services. And then we'll have some discussion with our expert, Amit, which we're, we're very glad to have here uh, today. Uh, credit where credit is due. This is a, the Georgia Tech Library renovation was a state project. So the owners, the Georgia Board of Regents and GSFIC, the using agency was Georgia Tech and the Georgia Tech Library. The architecture team was led by BNIM with Praxis 3. And the visioning team, which is a, a consultant the library uh, hired to help them develop a vision part of which is what led to the, this notion of uh, a new idea for library services, <clears throat> excuse me, was led by Bright Spot Strategies. And then uh, I'm, I'm uh, 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 citing a, a book that was very influential in putting the content together for this, for the, for the project, but also for this uh, webinar today, a book by Matthew Battles called Library, An Unquiet History that informs a lot of the history talk we're gonna talk about. It's a fascinating book. If you have any interest in libraries or books or anything, it's a really fun, really fun book to read. Uh, Amit is the one that recommended it to me and I, I've recommended it to several other people since then. So y'all know uh, me, Brian Tanner, I'm a principal of Praxis 3. We have Amit Doshi with the Georgia Tech Library, and Garrett has already gone through his long list of accomplishments and accolades. So let's get started. This is a cuneiform tablet. So starting in Mesopotamia, the first books were clay tablets. You'd press characters into them. They were very heavy, uh, but they were very durable and were generally stored in baskets that were labeled with other smaller cuneiform tablets with markings on them to tell you which, which books or which tablets were in the baskets. Here we see an illustration of what a Mesopotamian library may have been like. They would have called it that, I guess. Is that right, Amit? They wouldn't have called this a library, would they? I, yeah, unlikely, but, uh, but I do <laughs> like the knee-high the knee socks are a nice uh, fashion forward, even back Definitely. then. <laughs> Definitely. So the person on the right in the picture is making, is making a tablet. The person on the left is writing on a tablet, and I, I guess the person with the clever socks is the librarian. I don't know. We don't know what that person hey, is. Hey, librarians doing. have clever. I'm wearing clever socks right now, so. Okay, good. <laughs> you can see though uh, in the background you see baskets with their little round labels, and and so this is the way that the the, the books and the collection would have been would have been stored. We think. Moving on to Alexandria, which is the ancient library that most of us think about as the ancient library, the great library of Alexandria that, that was destroyed, no longer exists. So we're not quite certain exactly what it was, but um, we do know that by this time they had started using papyrus, which meant that they were dealing with scrolls and uh, only a generalized order was possible in this form of library. You would have heaps of scrolls labeled on the ends and kind of stuck into uh, cubbies or, or uh, 
uh, niches in walls or sometimes just in, in piles. It was kind of based on the Aristotle's idea of the peripatetic school, which literally means walking around and talking. So this was more like a university maybe than what we think of today as a library. Does that sound right to me? It does. And uh, my favorite thing about this image on the left, uh, it, not necessarily the scrolls in the on the shelf, but the, the small table where you've got uh, three, we'll assume scholars who are uh, pouring over material. But I like to think that they also went down to the canteen and had a, a cup of, uh, of coffee or whatever yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and talked about their respective disciplines and their respective ex expertise, because that's the that's a mission of the library that um, we see kind of at the forefront now is this crossing of cultures and crossing disciplines. Definitely. The, uh, they, we think that the role of the librarian in this library had to do with the preservation of exemplars. So uh, they would preserve original texts so that scholars could come in, copy them and study them and distribute them. And moving on to Rome, this is an example of a Roman library. Roman libraries were bilingual. So in the floor plan you see on the right, uh, uh, scrolls and books would be kept in those niches around the perimeter. The space would generally be divided by a bookcase that would have other materials in it. And on one side would be the Greek, the Greek reading room and on the other side, the Latin reading room. Um, this, was about the we, this was about the closest thing to a public institution that the, that the Romans had. And one interesting fact, the Christians, the early Christians introduced the idea of the codex to the Romans, which the codex is the predecessor of the bound book and starts to change pretty radically how, how libraries will function. To move to the Middle Ages, um, after, you know, writing became a perishable medium literally when, uh, when scholars were using these tablets with wax, wax tablets that could be written on, erased, written on again. Um, one of the things I remember I mean, talking about during design is during, during the past, how valuable books were, how books were, how rare they were, and how exclusive access to books was. Here you see how rare those books are. They're chained to the desk. Uh, so the book is definitely not being checked out. There is not a circulation desk in this library. You have to go to the shelf and pull the thing out and read it right there. Moving on to the Renaissance, the Medici's founded the uh, Library of San Marco. It's a beginning, we're beginning to, to get closer to our current idea of what a library could be. You still have these books chained to their, uh, chained to their storage places and their reading places, but on the ends of those pews, you see the, the lists, they're starting to keep a catalog of the books that are in the library. Um, these were generalized and somewhat disorganized catalogs a lot of the time. The Sorbonne introduced a radical idea of alphabetizing their catalog, which seems obvious to us, but um, I mean, these, these ideas take time to develop. Um, si simultaneously, or pretty close to the same time as this, the, the, the Oxford University Library in, in Britain uh, was developing a numerical system. So all of these things are sort of developing in parallel with one another at different places. At the Vatican, uh, the collection was organized by subject and each table in the, in the room would have us, would be dedicated to a subject and then the catalog would be alphabetized per table and then also organized by subject. It was a very complicated system and very difficult to maintain, uh, but uh, it was another sort of place-based way of organizing the, uh, a, a collection. By the time we get to the British Library, a little bit later, uh, a, a, a large uh, mansion was donated for the purpose of becoming a library. So it was an adaptive reuse of a, of a mansion to become a library. So not a custom built space, but uh, sort of a, a different use of, of, of a space. And like, a, like Alexandria, this was a universal library. It was a center of intellectual activity and a predecessor of what would come later in the 21st century with research libraries. Books were shelved according to size. It's again another way to categorize books, I guess. And uh, there are technological advances in this period that made the creation of libraries more possible, such as using iron and construction, larger spans, uh, better fire protection, better protection of the collection, and the ability to build larger spaces. 
which speaking of, ultimately when we get to the British Library, um, the, the, the modern uh, British Library, which is housed in the British Museum, uh, a, a, a famous librarian named Anthony Panizzi was kind of really responsible for creating this, what the, what the British Library would become. He transformed the catalog from an instrument of inventory to an instrument of discovery, which is the way that I always, I always think of the catalog as a discovery instrument rather than a cataloging instrument. He suggested a complete recataloging of the library and designed the, the circulation desk in the center with the reading room around it and the uh, collection in the walls of the library. Have you been to this space? I mean, I have, I have not. No, unfortunately, not yet. Although it does remind me as well of um, Library of Congress reading room mm. with that large yes. uh, circular circular desk in the middle. But yeah, that's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Simultaneously to this, there was a movement uh, based on the People's Charter. These Chartists reading rooms. Uh, the Chartist movement kind of ran out of steam, but the reading rooms they created, which were intended to elevate poor people and working people to become educated and to participate in society on a more equal basis, uh, those reading rooms survived and eventually kind of merged with some of the things that were happening at the British Library and the things that were happening in these rooms. They would, in the future, sort of come together. And you know, Brian, during the same era in, in England, there were these um, what they would call penny libraries, uh, coffee shops where you could read the news of the day. Uh, and that kind of access was also a sea change from previous times when, as you showed, you know, pictures of books chained to the wall, where you really had to be in, in an a, a elite member of society. Finally, you had these chartist societies and coffee houses that were democratizing access to information. And there's a, a philosopher, Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Habermas, who uh, draws a thread from, from this era of these chartist houses and coffee houses and access to newspapers to um, the 19th, 20th century kinds of revolutions, political revolutions that were taking place. So uh, an interesting uh, history there as well. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, of course, we all grew up uh, understanding the Dewey Decimal System, which uh, I, which was incredibly uh, uh, influential, developed by Melville Dewey. Um, he he proposed relative classification, so using numbers, so organizing the books according to the knowledge they contain, using numbers to indicate subjects or areas of knowledge. So this would join together the analytical simplicity of numbers to an intuitive system of knowledge, uh, a pretty radical way and a really liberating way to manage a rapidly changing catalog. But he was also a pretty controversial figure, wasn't he? Uh, I mean, he was, yeah. He, uh, I think he just had a lot of kind of personal demons that would um, come <laughs> out uh, throughout his life. Fascinating reading. Maybe, uh, you know, I'll leave it at that and let everyone start Googling uh, Dewey's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, definitely. He also did not invent the card catalog, but he standardized it. He created a company that sold materials to libraries. And so the, the card catalog that most of us uh, stereotypically think about is one that he popularized and standardized. So at the end of the 19th century, many librarians actually find themselves to be custodians of the collection more so than servers of the patrons. Um, in the 20th century, in fact, many libraries would hide the books from the public. Uh, in general, the famous uh, drawing on the left of the New York Public Library with the beautiful Rose Reading Room at the, at the top, and then seven levels of hidden of uh, private of uh, 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 closed stacks uh, below. And that's a beautiful drawing, but it also demonstrates, you know, the 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 way that services were were provided to the librarians at this time. During design, we sort of synthesized all these things in, in an attempt to understand the relationship between the, the media that, that were used from scrolls to the cloud today and what kind of technologies those implied and what storage uh, methods those implied and therefore what buildings those implied and then the service or the paradigm of how the library worked. One of the interesting things we found is a, some real connections between how we're thinking, how the, how the Georgia Tech Library was reinventing 
serve as here and the way it may have worked in some of the more ancient places. So let's talk about service precedents. These are, uh, on the left, you see uh, an image of a typical sort of retail environment, uh, lots of merchandise, people going, self-selecting, taking them to a centralized location where they buy the, buy the merchandise, the, the, the salesperson is behind the desk, the people go up. It bears, a very, uh, it bears a lot of similarities to the circulation desk in the British reading room, certainly. Whereas if you look at a store like Prada, the new Prada, the relatively new Prada store in New York City, an entirely different orientation to the merchandise. And this is more about experience. This is part gallery, part cafe, part shop, part art installation, part party. I don't know what. You don't see a, you don't see a checkout counter and the merchandise is used in a very different way. I mean, we looked at lots of examples of things like this while we were designing the building, I remember. We did, yeah, lots of retail and museums as well. That's another inspirational uh, site. Yep. Uh, computer stores, anybody that's spending time in the 80s, 90s, or early 2000s in a computer store will recognize this paradigm. And if you're a fan of a certain television show, you might recognize Christian Slater sitting behind the desk there. This is the Mr. Robot uh, computer store, if you watch Mr. Robot. But the, the, the stuff is all out on the shelves, packed in there, and the person behind the desk is definitely the gatekeeper of everything, whereas we all know what it's like to go to a Microsoft store or an Apple store. Where we were interested in the, 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 the way the store was designed, but more so the relative equality between the patrons and the salespeople. And it's hard to tell them apart except for the color shirt that the salespeople are wearing. But it's definitely a side-by-side -side experience where they're together uh, transacting uh, the transaction as opposed to having a, a, a counter that people go up to. The expertise is mobile. These are roving experts coming out to where the public is to help them. Looking at banks, very similar. Teller lines were definitely a secured partition between the workers or the bankers and the public. And you would line up and it's almost like a, like a, almost like a prison bar that you're having to go through to, to do your deal. That had to do with the, va the relative value of the stuff that was inside there and how they were passing it through. Once these things become more digital and virtual, you can liberate the teller line and these round uh, uh, desk type things are called, uh, I want to get the name right, dialogue pods, where customers and bankers meet at these places, can get on the computer, do their transaction, and then get their cash from a machine very much like an ATM. There's another example. So there is no teller line. There is no formal relationship. Everyone is kind of out in this living room type space with these dialogue pods. And finally, I mean, you mentioned using museums. The, di the dioramas of a traditional natural history museum or science museum has now been replaced with these hyper interactive uh, experiences. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you see the, the lines between uh, retail, museum, and kind of informal education all blurring because even in an Apple store, uh, the geniuses will teach you something. In fact, that's in many instances, they'd say that's their core purpose and that selling something is really ancillary to that. And here we are in, in universities where, you know, we're not about selling <laughs> things. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that's changed where, you know, while there's no financial transaction there between uh, the library staff member and the patron, there is this desire to gain their trust and gain their kind of um, allegiance to the library in a way, or at least allegiance to finding good information. And mm -hmm. that sometimes requires a bit of a sales pitch. So, yeah. so there's, that's how these worlds are starting to collide. Yeah. So let's talk about InfoDesk, which is the concept that the Georgia Tech Library came up with to deliver, that's the name they have for their service model. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the space is like, but we, what we really want to talk about for the rest of our time uh, is to hear from Amit about how the how the, the service is, is transacted in the library. So this is the Grove level of the library. This is the ground floor, the busiest level uh, in the entire facility. The white path you see going from left to right is a very heavily trafficked uh, kind of route through uh, the building. Um, on the right-hand side, the area you see in the red box is where the info desk occurs. And on its left-hand side is sort of a living room type space. In the middle is sort of an Apple store 
hype space with side-by-side -side transactions with roving uh, uh, librarians. And then on the far right side, you have expert librarians, research navigators, uh, subject area expert people that can give that can give really detailed and in-depth uh, guidance to scholars. Here you see a, a rendering of it. We, when we were designing this area, we talked about it. We used an analogy of a swimming pool, where it's the shallow end on on the the near in, in the near uh, in close. The first part where that's a living room type space is the shallow end, and then the research navigators, where you're doing deeper investigation, would be the deep end. Here's what it looks like almost finished. It's not quite done, and not all the furniture is there yet. But you can see a living room type space, the Apple Store type space, and then the uh, research navigators uh, further in. And this, this is how you would approach the space coming through the, the circulation path that we were talking about. And you don't see a big centralized circulation desk like you did in the British in the in the British Library. You see this kind of much more much more open and casual space. So, I mean, has it been hard to convince librarians to come out from behind the circulation desk? Uh, you know, it's strange. There's um, librarians are often see, viewed as early adopters, uh, but there are certain kinds of um, experiences that both patrons and librarians and library workers have come to expect. You know, you just showed uh, thousands of years of history. And a big chunk of that library history has involved a uh, centralized location with a desk usually pretty tall, where, um, especially with the Carnegie libraries, you know, you'd have to look up <laughs> to the librarian. <laughs> Sometimes you have to walk up. There's this procession, there's this kind of myth and ceremony of, um, of library services that has persisted for a long time. And certainly, you know, um, when, when I was growing up, I, I still have fond memories of of making a transaction at a desk, checking out my book. Um, however, we're in a position at Georgia Tech where we've moved our collections off-site. Um, you know, we're a very unique institution, and I guess that's what I always preface my remarks. I always say that we did the right thing, in, in our view, for Georgia Tech, for our collection, for our students, uh, for our disciplines, um, in terms of re prioritizing space versus collections. So by moving those collections off site, we're taking good care of them. They're in kind of climate controlled environments that'll um, help them last for the next several hundred years. But we've, we've, we now have spaces uh, like the library, um, the info desk area that you, that you showed, formerly called the library store, uh, now an info <laughs> desk. Um, we have spaces like that where we can start to experiment and try to align our services with what's going on in other realms of student life. Um, you know, every student I imagine at Georgia Tech has been to an Apple store. They've come to expect uh, multimodal services. So not just, you know, uh, calling or coming by, but the ability to text, to chat 24 hours a day. Um, we we offer services 24 hours a day. I think that's something that's kind of surprising to a lot of students. So uh, we know that they're working on things at three, four in the morning, and sometimes globally, and uh, and we can help them uh, through chat, email, phone, even in person uh, around the clock. Now all of that is pre-COVID. Uh, <laughs> right now it's a very different situation, but uh, but it's you know it's. It's a multimodal, multifaceted service philosophy. Uh, I think a lot of retail outlets, especially now, but even prior to to now, are were headed that way, where you know you could go to um, an Amazon physical store if you really had to. Uh, although I'm not sure if they're going to stick with that, uh, or <laughs> you could buy things online. Uh, it's you know it's it it's I, I don't want to treat it in uh, to halcyon terms here. I don't want to say like this is the best thing ever because it places a lot of stress on the institution. Trying to do all things for all people is um, not sustainable. So uh, we were charged by our dean to be a little more proactive and really more uh, take some cues from the retail environment where the, there's a need to kind of constantly be pulling in that next customer. Um, 
with Apple, you know, they want devotees. <laughs> mm. And I think libraries have benefited from having a natural user base. Uh, and just, you know, everyone uses the library. It was just assumed. Well, now we're in a situation where um, you can go to Wikipedia and maybe get some half-baked information. Um, and you don't have to fumble through the labyrinth of eBooks or electronic journal articles or library discovery systems to get to the really good stuff, you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. you may have to go an extra step there and uh, it's not going to be as um, nice and, uh, you know, easy to read as a Wikipedia article. Uh, it may require some deeper attention. So given those circumstances, how do we kind of reclaim uh, our customer base for good intent? You know, the intention is not to sell something, you know, we're not going to ask anyone to pull out a credit card, of course, but we want them to buy into the idea of, uh, of good information, the library and the librarians as guides to that, you know, uh, vetted uh, quality gold standard kind of information. And then really uh, for them to become um, not just consumers, but producers of scholarly material, you know, being part of that life cycle. Uh, we originally called it the library store because uh, we felt like we really needed to shake people up and get out of these kind of old ways of doing things. Um, we quickly realized, however, and this was, uh, you know, our student advisory board really led this conversation that many students, especially those that are maybe international, uh, when they see the word store or hear the word store, they think uh, financial transaction and they, you know, the I guess the cuteness of the term doesn't really translate. So, right. so we've moved on to InfoDesk, which is a very ubiquitous term in libraries. And um, but the the idea of providing proactive service and leveraging the kinds of things that the Apple Store does, or even that really great museums do with docents that are you know trained in improv, for example, those kinds of ideas still live on. And certainly the multimodal of uh, pathways to getting help 24 hours a day, those uh, are also very prominent in our service model. You mentioned serving the specific needs of Georgia Tech, the institution. Is, is Georgia Tech, uh, you, is, is, is the library at Georgia Tech a unique situation or is it a, a typical research library? I think uh, you know, there's the saying like the, the ARL is the Association of the Research Libraries, and there are 124 members, I think. And the saying is, if you've seen one ARL, you've seen one ARL. Because <laughs> they, they all have such unique, distinctive qualities. That said, there, you know, we noticed in working with Brightspot that there were some uh, environmental trends. You know, we've already talked about a few of them related to service. But uh, there are trends that are uh, all universities are facing. Um, this includes an increase in graduate students, for example, more online programs, um, less use of print collection generally, although that's not across the board. You know, at, in our uh, instance, that was very prominent. It was very obvious that the print collection was being used less. Uh, but a desire for more collaborative spaces more audiovisual kind of expertise required. Some of these are um, across the board. At tech, uh, I think the there are some more nuances to that. Um, for example, we have a, a space dedicated to the uh, uh, technologies of the past, but it's co-located and kind of intertwined with this high performance computing digital data visualization center. So we that's a very Georgia Tech kind of concept. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. You know, to have retro tech right with kind of new emerging tech. Um, so I think, and certainly the way that we connected uh, all of these spaces together, we are really become the academic crossroads of our campus. Um, I mean, that's that's going to have great benefits for, for the campus, you know, for generations of students to be so connected, uh, physically connected to north, south, east, and west. Um, so, yeah, I'd say, you know, I'd be careful not to say what we've done would work everywhere, but certainly some things we've done are being used elsewhere as well. Cool. Well, um, 
we I mentioned earlier that it's we talked a little bit earlier about it seeming like there's some similarities between some ancient modes of libraries and and the the types of services that you guys are talking about today is is that right are we do we do we think that is true is that the case well you know i i joke that uh those scholars uh hanging out at the library of alexandria went and got <laughs> something to eat there was a canteen in the library <laughs> of alexandria so and i think we're seeing that um it's now an expectation that if you have a a new library project that you would have some kind of food service, coffee service type of uh, environment. And some of those worlds were are starting to blend together. Uh, there's a Starbucks in a building that's attached to the library. It's a it's an undergraduate commons called the Clough Commons. And it is used as much as a study workspace as a place to get coffee. They're they're kind of intertwined and it's hard to kind of pull them apart. And I think the library cafe that's going to be in in the new Price Gilbert building uh, will have that same quality. Um, so I think some of that harkens back to earlier eras of the uh, the Chartist houses or even the French salons, you know, of the 18th century, um, the coffee houses of uh, England, where you could go and read for a shilling. Uh, I think some of those concepts are certainly. Um, they live on, and then just the desire for quiet, inspirational space to focus. Um, that's something that I am so kind of passionate about because we don't want uh, that to lose out in the desire to kind of be on uh, on trend uh, with what's happening. That need to focus with one piece of material is very human um, in wrestle with an idea. I mean, uh, you you cited I think uh, Aristotle or Socrates and it's you know you see the same kind of wrestling happening between a student and an engineering problem and they need a place to do that and it typically requires quiet uh, so so I'm very happy that we have this beautiful reading room in Crosland Tower uh, at the top of the building because that's where that some of that happens and um, it needs to be protected uh, it's easy for that to lose out to the the other things that are more exciting. Great. How are we doing on time, Garrett? We're in good shape, guys. Okay. Um, I, have, I do have another question. So in my career, I mean, you've talked a little bit about this already, but in my career as an architect, I've, when I began, I was drawing on the boards with a pencil and paper, and I've experienced the transition to early CAD and then AutoCAD and then BIM and now into 4D, 5D, 7D, all these different interactive information-based and data-based ways of designing. It's been a breakneck pace of change. In, in what ways have library services changed during your career? Quite dramatically. Uh, you know, when I was in library school, uh, the, the degree is the Masters of Library Science. Um, I did not do any, I don't recall doing any programming, uh, never taking a programming class. <laughs> and and now I'm teaching uh, these workshops with uh, about open data uh, using our programming to 200 people online, uh, and that happened in the span of 15 years. So that's I think that's been the most dramatic change has been the need for librarians to become uh, not just techno technologically aware but technologically proficient, uh, requiring continual advanced training. Um, and I think that in many ways, the reason librarians are um, are able to stay uh, ahead of the curve here is because there's a certain um, kind of psychological makeup uh, that attracts people to this profession. And it, there are people that want to be lifelong learners. They're kind of polyglots to begin with. And they, uh, and so, you know, it's not really always seen as a chore to have to take another class. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, it's so I, it's it's kind of the thing that keeps us going. So I think that bodes well for the profession during a period of rampant uh, technological change. Um, at the same time, we want to uh, you know be true to our our ideals and our values, and I think that's the other thing that I've noticed is um, there is this. Uh, 
this desire to really look deeply into uh, what the values of librarianship are, like equal access to uh, vetted information for everyone and creating pathways to access and scaffolding so that even if you're a first year undergraduate, you can get access and you can get become semi-proficient in um, audiovisual technique. You know, the library provides those tools, but we also provide the scaffolding to help you get there. Uh, we see that as a uh, kind of an equity issue. Uh, it shouldn't just be PhD students that have access to high performance computing. It should be everyone and will help students get to the next rung on the ladder. Um, you know, that I think that's a, a, a major change uh, from previous eras is desire to hold true to our values of access and privacy. Uh, there's a very exciting conversation happening now in libraries about the value of patron privacy when the expectation is that you want to have this kind of experience where the system knows what you want. <laughs> mm. uh, Amazon knows what you want and, you know, uh, and makes it super easy to order things. Well, that it doesn't necessarily compete with the value of privacy, but it certainly um, not doesn't go hand in glove. And we want to protect our the privacy of our patrons. Uh, and sometimes that makes um, being an early adopter a little more fraught. So, uh, so I think that's an exciting and, and important um, development is this resurgence of core library values. Fascinating. Did, did, when you were studying uh, for your library science degree, did you think uh, hosting a radio show or podcast would be part of your librarian duties? I didn't know. I did not. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 although um, I went to the University of Tennessee and, uh, you know, we have a large brick building, just like a lot of campuses. Um, and at the, t at the top of the building, I always thought it would be cool to have like a little radio station uh <laughs> who was he showed that clip from mr Ro that picture of mr robot uh wasn't in, he in a, a movie where he uh he started a little radio pirate yeah, radio station pumped up the volume in his yeah in his, right. his basement, he started a radio station pirate radio pirate radio so we me and my my librarians uh we were then students we thought it would be cool to create a little pirate radio station on top of the library <laughs> And now I guess I do that with a podcast. Uh, I know. <laughs> so I, you know, that's actually one of the exciting things about being a librarian and in this kind of uh, era where there's a lot of experimentation happening is you can you can try things like this. You can try putting together a podcast about music and libraries, and there's an appetite for risk and for adventure that wasn't necessarily there even 20 or 30 years ago. It's interesting that you men mentioned the, the mix of media because uh, a lot of libraries are, are definitely doing this. And, you know, we, we have just recently are, are in the process of wrapping up a project with ABAC uh, for their Carlton Center re renovation, which uh, houses their library, but as well, you know, their student newspaper, the periodical and the radio station. Um, it'll be a little bit nicer, a lot nicer than a, a, a pirate radio station, but uh, it makes sense that all of these things overlap with one another. Yeah, I think we're not just uh, content providers, uh, and this is across many institutions, uh, yours included, we're now content producers. Mm -hmm. And that comes with uh, need for new spaces, expertise, technology. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not just the library um, ma making things accessible, but actually staking a claim in certain areas and uh, and certainly academic librarians are required to publish and do scholarship and contribute you know uh, to the profession but we're seeing that with podcasting with webinars with public programming that that can even go get to a lot a wider audience um, of uh, of scholars and a global audience of scholars yeah the um Maybe in a future episode of, of this series, we'll talk more about the Scholars Event Network, which is really a, a, a unique program that you all developed for the library where uh, I've heard you all describe it as it's a place where uh, 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 original scholarship can be presented, captured, 
cataloged, stored, and then broadcast back out to the world for somebody else to bring down to use for their own scholarship, all within that one space, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, and the the thinking there was most universities have these scholarly talks. Uh, they're happening all the time, but they aren't captured necessarily, or if they are, they aren't cataloged, which means it's hard to find. Uh, and then it's sometimes uh, difficult to broadcast them in high quality and in a way that makes them legible to um, a lay audience or a global audience. And so that's our our goal for the Scholars Event Network. I'm pretty excited about that program. Very cool, very cool. So I think that may be a good place for us to wrap. Yeah. Um, We've got some I can't, I can't say how much we appreciate having you here. It's been fun, as it always is fun, uh, talking with you about this stuff. I could go on for a few more hours of this, but I don't think everybody will follow along with us. Yeah, th thanks, Anita, Brian. It, it's really interesting to hear the, uh, the history of libraries framed in the context of a, a cutting edge library that is, is about to open and relative to where uh, libraries are heading in the future. And if you just have just a few more minutes, we've got some excellent questions from some audience members that uh, you might address. Um, the first, I think, is is probably great for you to address immediately, if you don't mind. And it is from um, an attendee who says that their memories of a librarian is as an older adult. So does the, this change in user interface and the chain, does that change the type and age of the librarian to one more like a person in, in you know, in the Genius Bar example uh, that you would find in an Apple store? Well, I think, uh, you know, and I can only speak to uh, my, my uh, institution, um, there is uh, just a desire to, um, first, first and foremost, to create a little more diversity in the profession, uh, diversity of ages, diversity of background, diversity of expertise. Um, that's you know, very prominent in a lot of the, the discussion about uh, library education. Um, there are also emerging pathways. Uh, so I started out my career as a resident librarian, which means um, just like a medical resident, you try different things out for two years and you decide what you enjoy. And I think that's helped to uh, bridge that you know, because librarianship is often the second career, uh, in some cases a third career, um, but these kinds of pathways to the profession uh, where you can try things out may be more alluring to someone who's just out of undergrad and then decides they, you know, maybe they worked in, in their campus library and decides uh, uh, they want to explore a master's in library science. So the idea that you don't have to commit to just becoming a cataloger for the entirety of your career right out of the gate, um, these kinds of residencies can, can help to diversify the profession in terms of age. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, in terms of user interfaces, um, I think public libraries and academic libraries, we're all kind of wrestling with this. Uh, no one has a good answer on whether or not we should have a separate app just for the library. Um, you know, or if it goes out of date or requires so much kind of attention that it takes away from other areas. Uh, but there should be a very strong web presence. And especially since that is the main uh, pathway to access materials at Georgia Tech, most of our collection is electronic. And a lot of our experts are available electronically as well through consultation. I do a lot of, of these kinds of one-on-one -on -one research consultations now. So uh, in some ways, COVID has become a, an accelerant in this you know, need to be a little more digitally uh, available. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's, and then like multimodal kinds of ways to get in touch. You, know, you can chat with uh, a bot at most banks now, um, but I like the idea that libraries are still offering chat, but it's with a person because <laughs> the nature of the question is just too complex for right now for a bot to handle well. Uh, so great, great question, complex. Uh, we could probably do a whole <laughs> series just on the user interface. <laughs> well, well, thanks for the response. And then uh, you mentioned this in passing, but I just want to make sure that the person that asked, and you've talked a lot about career development and, and how uh, you come into a role like yours, um, but uh, just to reiterate, what does one major in to become a librarian? What what is the degree and and the focus there? Mm -hmm. 
It requ typically requires an undergraduate degree and then what's called a master's in library and information science. Uh, it's referred to as MLS. Um, and that's the uh, that's the the kind of the degree that's required to become officially a librarian uh, as designated by the American Library Association. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. And then uh, the last question here is whether, oh, sorry, misreading. Um, well, we, we talked about the roles of librarians as um, protectors of, of books and knowledge. Um, and then the, the question is really, how, how do you, some of your colleagues feel about their new, more interactive roles? And do you anticipate that being a difficult transition for them? Well, I think, uh, you know, just as I had mentioned that there's a psychological makeup that attracts people to the profession. Uh, one dimension of that is the desire to learn and to educate others. But another dimension of that, I think, is also maybe a little bit more of the introvert than the extrovert uh, side. And I think that's where there is there are some challenges to, you know, um, to kind of getting out of uh, our old ways of uh, interacting. Um, now, because uh, our interactions are no longer just face to face, in fact, that may be the a small number of interactions that may be more digital or through email or through chat and phone. I think that makes it a little more easy to be um, more proactive with our users. And, you know, certainly I've had long <laughs> relationships with students that have been entirely over email. Uh, you know, they never, I've never actually seen them, but I've worked with them for years uh, because they <laughs> just know to email me and I'll provide a response. Um, so there's, there's other ways to be more proactive. Uh, I think that there's a, still a need for us to get out of the building, physically out of the building and into classrooms, into research labs, into faculty meetings across campuses, for example. Um, so, and that, uh, that's still happening. That transition is still happening. Um, you know, I think most deans, uh, they really ask that their librarians spend a lot of time um, in, in uh, places other than their office. <laughs> uh, hmm. So, and that's not necessarily easy. And I don't think it's necessarily just a, a question of being a little reticent, but it's just all of the competing responsibilities of, uh, of the job uh, make it sometimes difficult to do that uh, with what are what's called liaison librarians. So subject librarians, um, there's it's become more the norm that you really get to know your discipline you get to know the seminal works in the field so i'm public policy for example and i know the field really well i have a second master's in in uh, public administration um, and i think the faculty and the students see me as um, as one of them not uh, you know not just a librarian or not part of a different institution but it integrated into their field so that's uh I think that's a great question. Um, it's it's a difficult one to kind of answer in a <laughs> concise statement, but there is a need to get out there a little more and just to be more present. Uh, and actually, one one that's that's a, it really reminds me of something else that the design team worked on, and that um, we're trying to let people know about our expertise and our about our invisible collections. You know, it's one thing to go into a library and you see like seven stories of print books and you know immediately okay there's information here <laughs> if you go into a library like georgia tech and you don't see that kind of those stories of print collections uh what signals that there's information here that there's expertise here that there's um information that's better than just kind of random websites and that's been a design challenge um it, it requires us to get out there and do sales essentially um, but it also requires a new way of you know using media and places like the info desk uh, the library store concept to create that culture of um, knowing that the best information is accessible like that's a that's an interesting challenge that is an interesting challenge and uh, i'd refer anyone in the audience that wasn't able to join for the first part of our uh, webinar series to to check that one out. It's on the website. It's available, and it, it touches on 
um, the things that, that you're mentioning uh, as well, Amit. So, well, thank you guys uh, for everything and, and thanks for those questions. Um, later today, you will receive an email that will allow you to download today's presentation and the option to take a short survey. We appreciate your feedback and be glad to answer any future questions you may have. We hope that you'll join us for our next discussion, which will focus on uh, leveraging technology for active learning and how the Georgia Tech Library includes uh, programmatic areas dedicated to helping teachers flip their classroom, helping students execute project-based assignments, and helping both groups develop materials and strategies for distance learning. Uh, so thanks again and for joining, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.